celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, from far away, grain bins look harmless, but one wrong move and they can be deadly. We'll take you to a workshop to let you know what steps you can take to stay safe. And did you know meatloaf can be healthy? No, not that meatloaf, this kind. We're going to show you how, with some fun ingredient substitutions, sure to cut out unnecessary fat and calories. Biscuits and coffee sound good, and they sound even better inside a beautiful lush greenhouse. We'll tell you where this is and how you can join in on the fun. And this little piggy went to market, but this little piggy is tearing up your farm. We'll examine the wild hog problem and see what you can do to regain control of your land. Farm Week starts right now. everyone. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Mullick. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. One month of 2017 down. We got a fresh new month of Farm Weeks for you, starting with this one right here today. That is certainly right, Troy. And our first story today deals with a very serious issue that farmers need to know about. According to recent studies, farming is one of the most dangerous careers in the United States. Factors such as operating heavy equipment, exposure to environmental hazards, and handling powerful livestock are some of the reasons why. Working around grain bins is also risky, and Farm Week's Amy Myers reports farmers at the recent grain bin simulator and rescue training learned how to prepare for worst-case scenarios. Only 2% of the U.S. population is comprised of hard-working farmers dedicated to feeding the nation, so keeping them safe is important to maintain production. According to a 2014 study by Purdue University Extension, 38 documented grain bin entrapments resulted in 17 deaths, the highest in numbers since 2010. That year, 59 entrapments claimed 26 lives. Recently, Mississippi Farm Bureau and MSU Extension provided farmers with a training experience that was as real life as it gets. And this is our grain bin rescue simulator and extraction simulator. And what it does is allows farmers or rescue personnel, first responders, to get a first-hand look at what it's like to be entrapped inside a grain bin. And from there, the steps we take in order to extricate or rescue somebody or get them out from it. Um, we can go all, over through all the negatives and the positives of what happens, um, things to look out for, um, medical conditions that need to be taken into account, and just go through a step-by-step process for when it does happen, Everybody's prepared. Talk to me about this piece right here. What does this do? All right, this is part of a four-part system that basically connects together around the victim. And once it's around them, it pretty much protects them from compression. And then we can actually auger the corn out from around them. Once the rescue tube is in place, a device called a rescue auger propels the corn out from around the victim who then uses the rungs inside to climb out. Without this equipment, it takes 300 pounds of force to pull out a 165 pound adult who's trapped up to the waist. Farm Bureau of Safety Specialist Benton Mosley says it's important for farmers to purchase their own rescue gear, like a rope and pulley system, harness, and rescue tube. Those items need to be ready at all times, so the rescue process will go faster if there's an accident. Also, check with local dispatchers to confirm that GPS and internet maps can accurately lead rescuers to your grain bin if the need arises. Never enter a grain bin alone and always have your cell phone. From West Point, Mississippi, I'm Amy Myers reporting. Mississippi Farm Bureau offers various types of safety and rescue training for firefighters, Sevier County officials, and farmers throughout the state. For information about training opportunities near you, visit msfb.org backslash safety. Homemade meatloaf may be the definition of comfort food, but hold on. 
Did you know there are ways that can cut calories and fat from this weeknight staple to make it a little healthier? In this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us how to give meatloaf a food factor makeover. Nothing says home cooking like a delicious slice of meatloaf. But I'm ready for a new twist to an old family favorite. It's time for a Food Factor recipe makeover. Meatloaf may seem old fashioned, but it gives you an opportunity to get creative. Try combining ground meats such as beef, turkey, chicken, or pork. For a low calorie meatloaf, you can even substitute ground mushrooms for a portion of the meat. Traditional recipes call for breadcrumbs as a binding agent, but you can also use instant rice, cornflakes, crackers, croutons, or oats. Don't tell the kids, but meatloaf is a great place for sneaky chefs to hide vegetables. Carrots, spinach, zucchini, celery, onions, and bell peppers all make nutritious additions to this dish. You can even further disguise your veggies by serving mashed cauliflower and steamed broccoli instead of the usual mashed potatoes and peas. So next time when you make meatloaf, try one of these options or create your own secret family recipe. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Another way to boost the flavor of your meatloaf, let it rest five minutes after cooking. Well, this time of year, it's hard to find beautiful outdoor gardens in Mississippi. So in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us how an old greenhouse is being used in a pretty interesting way. As the Southern Gardener, anything dealing with new and unique takes on horticulture grabbed my interest. So the greenhouse on Porter in Ocean Springs quickly became one of my favorite hangouts. This place is interesting because it's actually a vintage 1940s greenhouse repurposed into a coffee and biscuit joint. The old head house has become the front lobby where visitors order their food. The kitchen where the delicious biscuits are baked is also found here. Walk through the door into the greenhouse proper and you're quickly reminded of this building's original purpose. You're greeted by a huge blue sky vine that is vigorous and adds a tropical flair. There are also planter boxes that contain easy to care for succulents and other indoor plants. I love the construction of old greenhouses and the greenhouse and porter doesn't disappoint. The windows feature old style individual glass panes supported by wooden frames. They even fold out, and when the ridge vent is open, provide natural ventilation when the weather permits. There's a variety of custom-made tables and seating that are often decorated with more greenery and color. A lot of other interesting color is provided by numerous exhibits of local arts and crafts, including the stained glass on display. But that's not the only art to be found. Reviews of the shop claim that the coffee and biscuits have been raised to an art form. As a horticulture guy, I find nothing more homey than a greenhouse. That's why I'm right at home here at the Greenhouse on Porter. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. And we've posted a link to the Greenhouse on Porter on the Farm Week Facebook page. You'll be able to get directions to the place, see some pictures, see everything they got going on there. Sounded like a good idea, and I'll have to check that out next time I'm on the coast. That is a good idea. In fact, I think I'm going to head on over to Ocean Springs now and check it out. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll check you guys out later. You got the marker report for us, though, right? Uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the winning end of this no, proposition. You, you, you though, got it. I'll but, see you. Uh, you got but, it. It's but good. here it goes in the markets this week. We'll check out farm raised catfish prices first. Later, the cattle on feed report catches traders by surprise. Discussion continues on whether beans will be the more desired crop this spring, and fewer acres of winter wheat have some implications for the grain markets. 
Well, more catfish was processed in the U.S. in December compared to a year ago. This according to the latest numbers. The average pond bank price paid across the United States is $1.20 per pound for the premium size. Those farm sales were up 9% from the same time in 2015. Processor sales, meanwhile, are almost flat in the latest monthly report. Well, many livestock analysts were caught a little off guard by the larger numbers in the monthly cattle on feed report. New Extension Livestock Economist Dr. Josh Maples talked to me about what happened and what it may mean to the trade down the road. Why is the placements number such a surprise to the trade this time? Leighton, I think the biggest surprise is the amount of the increase that we saw year over year. So cattle placed in the feedlots in December of 2016 were a little over 17 percent higher than the same time period in 2015. And a big driver of this is increased placement of lighter weight cattle. So cattle, 600 to 700 pound cattle, we saw a 27% increase in placements uh, over December 2016 over December 2015. Mm -hmm. And one of the main, or a couple of likely reasons for that are the grazing conditions in the Southern Plains and in the Northern Plains. So in the Northern Plains, we've seen uh, better than usual fall grazing conditions. So producers were able to graze cattle all the way through the first part of December before having to move them on. Uh, and then in the southern plains, the winter wheat conditions are not as great as we might like for them to be. And so some producers are having to move cattle off of their uh, winter wheat operations earlier than they might like. And so this is kind of what's driving, or is possibly what's driving some of the lighter cattle being moved into feedlots in early. Well, I also understand the marketing's figure in this latest report was a little larger than the trade expected. What's going on there? Sure. So, you know, I. It is a little greater than we might expect, but one good thing that comes from this and a significant point of this is that I think feedlots are more current this year than they were last year, especially, especially. so if we look at last year, we saw kind of this building um, a number of cattle and feedlots that were market ready. So cattle that were fed could be moved on uh, at any time, just waiting on the right conditions. This year, I think feedlots are a lot more current. And so the cattle that are being marketed are actually cattle that have just gotten to the point where they're ready to be marketed. So I think that's an encouraging sign that we won't see this large number of cattle hitting the uh, beef market at the same time. The chicken industry in neighboring Arkansas is under attack by animal rights and environmental groups. The groups want USDA and the Small Business Administration to stop making federal loans available for poultry facilities until there's a study done. The groups want to report on the impact of huge chicken house complexes on the animals, the environment, and public health. Well, we switch into our trivia quiz now. This week we're asking about cotton, and here is the quiz. What year did Mississippi have the most cotton acres planted? Is the answer A, 1930, B, 1937, C, 2004, or D, 2014? We'll have the answer coming up. It's time now for a quick break, but more Farm Week is just ahead. Will the wheat explosion from January continue? Layton will answer that for us, and you won't want to miss our feature story today. Wild hogs are causing headaches across much of the country. We'll examine the problem and see what you can do to regain control of your land. It's a hogumentary coming up on Farm Week. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh, local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips, no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Now it's the time when we highlight some exciting things happening within the state of Mississippi. If you're feeling blue, then why not try some blueberries? Here's your Farm Week Focus. This week we're taking you to the Lake Terrace Convention Center in Hattiesburg, Mississippi for the 2017 Blueberry Education Workshop. This year's event was co-hosted by Dr. Alba Colliert from Mississippi State University's Department of Agricultural Economics and Dr. Eric Staffney from the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences. Throughout the day, a variety of in and out of state speakers shared the latest information on blueberry research. 
Presentations during the workshop included consumer demand for local blueberry food products, upcoming food safety regulations, breeding and genetics, and the unveiling of a new website and mobile app to help growers manage the plant's growth. Speakers also cover the latest on spotted wing drosophila, an important and timely topic for blueberry growers in Mississippi. About 100 people attended the event this year, more than double last year. If you have an event to tell us about, let us know, and you could see it on our next Farm Week Focus. Well, despite a sharp break in soybeans at the beginning of the week, many traders still seem confident that beans will win an acreage battle with corn in 2017. Broker Nolan Cullen says the weather is still the wild card as far as what really happens. I think soybean acres will become uh, a more desired crop to plant, uh, not only here in Mississippi, but across the entire country. There is a cost benefit uh, that would shift desire to plant soybean acres over corn. Uh, of course, a big factor will be weather. Uh, depending on the planting conditions of, of corn, any delays there could push acres into soybeans and also could push acres over into cotton. Well, March wheat futures hit a three-month high during January, and traders seem to think this market has indeed found a floor. Angie Setzer notes that winter wheat acres are way down, while demand is running real strong. We've put, the, put to bed the southern hemisphere for the most part. I think Argentina is, is just getting wrapped up with harvest. Australia had a huge crop. So those surprises have, have been, or those knowns in the market are, are now put away. Now we're focusing on the, the new crop development side of things. And we have the lowest wheat acres, winter wheat acres on, on, uh, that have been planted since 1909. Um, so that's saying something. Um, stocks are, are still burdensome, but it's, it's similar to what we're seeing in soybeans. The demand for wheat is so great that we really can't withstand a production hiccup anywhere in the world. Um, so it, it will be monitored very closely. The site for next week's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions and the Mississippi Cattlemen's Association meeting won't be around much longer. The Mississippi Business Journal reports the trademark in Jackson is being replaced by the addition of a new exhibit hall on the east side of the Mississippi Coliseum. Construction begins by the end of the year. And we return to our trivia quiz to wrap things up here in the markets. Our topic is cotton, and the answer this week is A. Mississippi recorded its highest cotton acreage in 1930. 4.1 million acres were planted that year. When you're a farmer, the bottom line is everything. The weather and fluctuating commodity prices alone are enough to cause a few sleepless nights. So the last thing you need to worry about is a wild animal damaging fields and disrupting the natural habitat. Today, we examine the feral hog problem that's affecting much of the United States and what experts here in Mississippi are doing to find a solution. I don't think currently there is a county in Mississippi that does not have a hog walking on it right now. If populations keep expanding over the next 10 years, 10 to 15 years, like they've done the last 10 to 15 years, we're going to go from about half of Mississippi land area occupied by wild hogs to 100%. Uh, a home just out on the edge of town, pigs had come into, into the fellow's yard there and rooted up his yard. And I heard a lot of people talking about it after that, we didn't realize there were these you know, wild pigs in the area. Well, you know, they're, they're here. Seven years ago, as we're hunting, me and my son, I find a walla. I knew what it was when I saw it, and I asked a friend of mine that hunts in the same bottom, and he said he had actually saw a hog turkey hunting. The following year, we got to seeing more sign. The next year, the population exploded, and we said we're going to start trapping hogs. I did one site visit where probably 80% of the yard was rooted up. They did use a game camera, and I think they counted about 18 pigs in this group. If in 10 to 15 years, 100% is occupied by wild hogs, the damage estimates are, are going to be out of control. It's going to negatively impact so many people's lives. And we're going to look back, back in the early 2000s, in 2010, 2015, and wish we had acted on it. 
So now, now's the time to act before it's too late. We've had hogs, wild hogs in Mississippi for probably well over 50 years. Um, and they were isolated in small pockets, just like in a lot of the US. But it's really over the past 20 years, and especially the last 15 to 10, is what we've seen this rapid expansion. We probably have a couple hundred thousand hogs in Mississippi, whereas in places like Texas, you have in the millions. So we're, we're not there yet, and we don't want to get there, but, but we certainly have enough to be causing a tremendous amount of damage. Initially, we thought, well, wow, that's neat. We've got pigs here that give us something else to hunt, and you know, it was kind of novel for us. Uh, but that, real quickly, that changed, and um, we began realizing, you know, the the damage that they did, and and it just uh, you know, got to be where I didn't like to see pigs anymore. Didn't want a pig anywhere near the place. My objective with my property is to promote wildlife as as much as I can. My family and friends, we we hunt here. I plant uh, probably. 15 to 20 acres of food plots each year. And uh, you know, it's really frustrating. When the pigs come through and destroy it, that's, that's gone. All that time and effort, the money that it costs to buy seed and fertilizer, um, you know, that effort's gone. The hog numbers have increased and our deer numbers have decreased. Uh, it's, it's affected our enjoyment of the property. My objective with this place is to make it into a, a premier wildlife habitat. It's very difficult to do with the pigs. I love this land. It's, uh, it's an important place uh, for me and my family. And in a lot of ways, my children have grown up here with me. We've, we've spent, uh, we spent a lot of time here together, a lot of quality time. I want my family to be able to continue to do this, you know, for many generations. I hope that they can. They get into a hay field and just, they can just tear it up like a bomb went off in it. And it makes the ground just terribly rough. Of course, it kills what's there. It's just like somebody disc a fill up and didn't do anything to it. I mean, they just tear it up and grass grows back over and you don't even know it's there. Monetarily, the damage it does to us would be damage to our hay fields and then uh, just wear and tear on your equipment. I mean, banging around with a, a hay baler and a tractor is just rough on them and the, the more you beat them up, the quicker they're gonna wear out. So, you know, you may not realize that the money's coming out of your pocket tomorrow, but five years down the road, but here's a big bill and it was caused by all this rough ground that you rode over. I'm a small time guy. I don't have a, a big profit margin to start with. So anytime that I waste money, it hurts my bottom end on the, you know, whether I make a profit or not. We've heard this so many times at our workshops when we're working uh, with, with landowners, someone will come up and say, you know, five years ago we saw the first hog and we thought it was kind of cool. And literally, all these people will say within three to five years, now they're completely out of control. Literally, this animal can have a reproductive rate two times that of white-tailed deer. And everyone knows how many deer we have throughout the U.S. and throughout Mississippi. And so our role in extension is number one, we want to educate people and let them know that you don't want this animal on your property. And then secondly, if you have hogs, if you are currently experiencing damage, let's educate you on one of the best, most cost-effective and efficient techniques for trapping them and uh, limiting their populations. The website that we created, wildpiginfo.com, has been a good delivery system. We have on there different material like how to build a trap. We have diagrams, uh, how to place trail cameras for monitoring the trap. We tried to think of everything possible that someone would want to know about wild hogs. The website that we have, the videos that we have, you know, we're, we're literally all throughout North America. A lot of people know Mississippi State Extension and what we're doing with, with, with the hog damage program. So. I want to know and hope that extension has played a role causing the decline, at least in some areas of wild hogs. Trapping wild hogs is a big challenge. The ones that have had success have pretty well followed our protocol that we outline. You've got to scout the area out, you put out trail cameras, you try to get an idea of how many hogs there are. No running dogs, no shooting while you're trying to trap. and. Uh, being able to get them in a trap. 
What I hope people will take away from this video is, is first of all an understanding of how serious this problem is so that we can in general, the citizens of Mississippi can stand up and say we don't want this. Hopefully we can stop this in its tracks before it gets any worse. And again, that uh, website is wildpiginfo.com. This is the type of story impacting farmers, not only in Mississippi, but across much of the country. As that map showed in that story. Mm -hmm. and researchers here at Mississippi State University Wildlife Fisheries and Aquaculture are always working on new ways to uh, try and combat this huge problem. Yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, give you updates on that as we hear right here on Farmway. So that's going to do it for this week's show. I want to turn, tune in next week, though. we got another good one. We are checking out an organic farm, a farm where they're growing lots of specialty crops. Learn about the health benefits and see if they would work for you. And who needs flowers? We're showing you some Valentine gift ideas that your partner in gardening will love. Plus, the decline in printing and paper use has been felt in the forestry industry. Enter wood pellets. We'll head to a Mississippi production facility to see new ways they're helping make up for some disappearing markets. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Troy Molin. And I'm Leighton Spann. We will see you next time.